Speech perception doesn't always occur easily. One of the ideas that comes up very often in conversations with people who have hearing loss is the fact that there's often a need to mentally correct a misperceived word as you continue to listen. In this talk, we will discuss work related to that exact topic as we explore the mental cost of repairing errors in speech perception. Another alternative title for this talk is an idea we've supported for many years, which is that a person's listening effort is not the same as the intelligibility score. It makes sense that a correct perception should be less effortful and an incorrect perception should be more effortful. However, real situations are more complicated since we normally don't have direct access to a person's perception. Instead, we have access to how they ultimately respond in a task. We play a stimulus, it goes through the auditory system, and then it passes through a black box, which is actually a pink squishy box, and then we get a response. But you could misperceive a word, but still realize what the word was based on context. Or maybe you get an answer totally wrong, but not even realize it. You might think, shouldn't we just care about performance? Well, as it turns out, people with hearing loss, when asked about their own experience and challenges, talk often about effort, fatigue, anxiety, nervousness, but not accuracy. Sure, these concepts have a relationship, but the factor that seems to relate to a person's level of satisfaction and confidence in communication seems to be effort rather than raw performance. Effort also appears to be linked with various important things like physical and mental health, financial security, and social engagement. And so we think that effort is worth measuring as a worthwhile concept by itself, independently of performance scores. And the kind of effort we're interested in in this study is the act of mentally correcting perceptual errors. We're focusing on this because it's thought to happen very often in people who have hearing loss. To give you a sense of what we mean when we say correcting a misperception, imagine that you hear the words, the glide, but then you hear the rest of the sentence, wore a long white dress, you think for a moment, that word glide doesn't really belong, and given the context, it was probably the bride who wore a long white dress. This might happen if you misperceive the word bride as glide, or also if that word were simply masked out by noise. So we're thinking about the effortful use of context in reverse. And our question for the study is, how much effort does that process actually take? Does it slow you down? And most importantly, how could we even test for it? It's tricky because by definition, we've said that this process is normally invisible. To test this idea, we developed a set of stimuli that force a specific error and then let the listener recover from that error gracefully, so that they ultimately get the correct answer, but only after a brief moment of mental correction. Here's how we did it. We made sentences where the first few words were not very useful in predicting any upcoming words, so there's no forward-going context. Here, for example, it's very hard to guess what word should fill in where those X's are. But now that you see the rest of the sentence, it should be very easy to fill in those gaps. So when you repeat back that full correct sentence, we know as the experimenter that you didn't actually hear it correctly because we didn't let you hear it correctly. So we can be sure that your correct answer included that little extra bit of mental work to fill in the gap. To create the stimuli, we first recorded 150 sentences, just like the ones you just saw, and then there were two different stimulus manipulations. First, the target word was replaced by speech spectrum noise that had the same duration and the same intensity as the original word. The second type was an intentional mispronunciation of that target word, used to simulate a misperception of the type that you'd see for people who have hearing loss specifically consonant place of articulation. We wanted to force this kind of mistake so that we could see what the ensuing cost was. An important point to make here is that we recorded these sentences in what I call an audiologist voice, slow, steady, clear articulation, so that if there were any mistakes made, we could be confident that they were the mistakes that we enforced prospectively, rather than the typical mistakes that you'd see when perceiving casual speech. Based on these stimulus manipulations, we would expect to see a brief increase in cognitive effort shortly after that error. And that's exactly what we found. We measured effort using pupillometry, which tracks the increase in pupil dilation over time as a person listens to the sentence. We can see the landmarks here. There's the sentence, and there's the response after the two-second delay, which you see represented in the vertical gray bar. We tested a group of listeners with normal typical hearing thresholds, 
as well as a group of listeners who use cochlear implants. All participants spoke American English as their native language. For listeners with normal hearing, listening to a normal sentence with no words missing, we see this pattern of pupil dilation, where we get a peak right near the offset of the sentence, and we also get a second peak corresponding to the behavioral motor response giving their response out loud. That's not really the focus of our current analysis, so I'm just going to hide that in the background a bit. When the target word is mispronounced, there's a short-term bump in pupil dilation that quickly returns back to the normal trajectory of what we see when the sentence is intact. And when the target word is replaced by noise, there's a much more substantial increase in dilation that also lasts longer. So from these results, we think that the cognitive cost to repairing misperceived words scales with how much repair you have to do. When you're needing to correct just a single phoneme, like picture to picture, there's just a small brief cost. But when you need to fill in an entire missing word, there's a much more substantial cost. And for those who are curious, you can zoom into that part of the graph here to learn some precise timing details of the pupil response. Following an acoustic disruption of the sentence, replacing the speech with noise, you see a deflection in the pupil response at about 0.7 seconds, which is just about the fastest audio-evoked cognitive response you'd ever see from a pupil. The mispronounced word, on the other hand, is a linguistic disruption, and for that you see a later deflection, delayed by an additional 400 milliseconds or so. So when comparing this group against the group of listeners who use cochlear implants, we can see some similarities and some differences. Notably, there's not as much difference between the intact sentences and the mispronounced ones. And this follows a prediction made by Pisoni and Herman in 2002, who hypothesized that when using cochlear implants, everything would sound mispronounced, and especially place of articulation, since it's not very easily perceptible when the spectral contrast is degraded. More interesting for us, though, was noticing how there was a shallower slope of pupil constriction after that peak dilation. Shallower slope after the peak has been observed in other earlier studies to correspond to difficult situations that demand more cognitive control, such as listening to faster sentences, sentences that lack context, performing mental arithmetic, hearing sentences in a language you're not fluent in, or processing sentences where you've made an error. So if all you do is just look at those slopes after the peak, what you can see in the CI listener group is a signature of lingering uncertainty. And so the first conclusion we have from the study is that sentence perception can be effortful for a person even if they're giving a correct response. In this case, the answers were correct, and yet the mental action needed to fill in those missing words incurred some cognitive cost. Returning back to our original intuitive hypothesis, we need to update this because correct answers are not necessarily less effortful. And now we move on to the other side of that hypothesis. First, we should say that there are many different ways to misperceive a word. The most intuitive kind of mistake is a phonetic error. Hearing clock as plot or grease as lease, these errors occur fairly often, especially in low context sentences here in red, compared to the high context sentences marked in black. There are many other kinds of errors, such as syntactic mistakes and also semantic errors, which I'll spend some time on here. When the sentence is, the doctor prescribed the drug, and the person says, the doctor prescribed the pill, we don't view that as a phonetic mistake. There's no sound similarity between those words. Instead, we view it as substituting a word that is semantically coherent. Another sentence is, Paul wants to speak about the bugs. And one participant said, Paul wants to speak without the mic. The word substitution flows semantically from speak, and also happens to be the kind of thing a person would notice, especially if they had hearing loss. Because in a room full of people with normal hearing, someone might think that they don't need a microphone, but if you have hearing loss, you really want the speaker to use a mic. There are also times where a listener gives a guess that is even more plausible than the original stimulus. For example, we are considering the cheers was replaced as we are considering the choice. This makes more sense because a choice is something you consider, but cheers would be an unusual thing to consider. There are also occasions where the participant's response is actually total nonsense. For example, may what we get in days. This happens fairly often enough that we keep track of it, although these represent only about 15% of the cases. Most of the time, there's some kind of linguistic closure to the response. 
So we've tracked the proportion and the incidence of these responses, and what we did was track the ensuing effort as indicated by the change in pupil size. The questions we had were, do errors always result in more effort? And the short answer is no. In the data I'm about to show, effort was found not to scale with the number of mistakes, but rather scaled with the amount of work needed to make sense out of the perception. There are many different comparisons being made here, so I'm just going to simplify the data to show the mean pupil dilation near the peak. When you have a correct response for these sentences, this is the mean proportional dilation that we see. Now, suppose you make only one error, but it results in nonsense, like we played a game of cough and mouse. We see a noticeable increase in pupil dilation. But if you make another single error that results in a sentence that makes sense, like our seats were in the second row versus in the center row, both of these are reasonable sentences. The bride wore a white dress versus wore a white veil. This is another single error, but both of these sentences are reasonable, and so we don't see that much extra effort, if any. Here we show a response for making three mistakes in the same sentence, but the result is actually still sensible. There are occasions where the participant gives a complete guess and has nothing to do with the original stimulus, and in those cases, the pupil response looks no different from when the answer was correct. Related to this is the case where they give a guess that was actually more plausible than the original sentence. The stimulus actually was, they were considering the cheers, and the response was, they were sitting in the chairs. That's an even more normal sentence than the stimulus, and so we actually saw lower pupil dilation. And we think the reason for this is that the brain can go into autopilot mode and just guess what the sentence will be based on the most likely sequence of words. And so the pupil response is a signature of when the brain exits that autopilot mode to actually exert cognitive control. It doesn't have to do with the number of mistakes, it's how much work you need to do to make sense of that perception. Now suppose your answer is very similar acoustically to what the stimulus was, but doesn't make any sense. That's what we call a phonetic nonsense error. The cough and mouse example from before is an example of this. It's a case where there's no reasonable semantic relationship between your error and the original word. It's just based on sound similarity. So the brain can't really easily reconcile the meaning of the sentence. But what about errors that specifically relate to the meaning of the sentence? If you have to construct an entirely new sentence out of another one, that takes a little bit of work. Turning the dealer shuffled the cards into the dealership sold the cars is a complete misunderstanding of the original sentence, and yet it still has some internal coherence. But what about if you're just given a low context sentence? As it turns out, this process is actually easier, because you don't need to find as many words that neatly fit together. If the only meaningful word in the sentence was jar, then you can just think of whatever concept goes with that word easily, like opening a jar, and that turns out to be less effortful. There are many more examples of how the nature of the error is more important than the number of errors. In the full-scale analysis, we had over 30 different categories, spanning different numbers of errors, replacements of names, articles, syntactic errors, sensible versus nonsensible, different patterns of phoneme errors, and the thing that comes out on top almost every time is the sensibility of the response rather than the number of errors. There's a richness to this data set that is intuitive in hindsight and yet has not been fully appreciated in the scientific study of listening effort. And so the message we leave you with is this. Listening effort is more about the action taken to try to correct mistakes rather than the mere presence or number of those mistakes. Here's why this is important. When we normally test speech recognition, the listener could give a correct response, but it doesn't mean they heard all the words correctly. And that little extra moment where you have to exert control over your perception, that's the extra activity that we think is worth keeping track of and which contributes to listening effort. It's not really clear how to tell when this happens, and yet it probably happens pretty often for people with hearing loss and plays a role in their ability to communicate fluently. Mistakes are not quite as effortful when they result in meaningful and coherent sentences, underscoring the importance of recognizing the nature of errors rather than just the number of errors. There are plenty of other ideas that we don't have time to discuss today, 
but we look forward to your questions, comments, and input about this work. Thank you for listening.